Hello everybody, Fran here. This video is uh, part two of a very small series on the reign of Mary the First. Uh, part one looked at government and religion, so watch that if you haven't already. And this video is going to look at religion, society and economy. The starting point with religion then is how much support for Catholicism is there in England when Mary takes over? Now, what you'll see is there are various examples you can use in assess work to suggest that there was support for Catholicism. For example, in August or from August, there were masses said in Yorkshire. You could use um, the view of Tudor historian here who notes that Mary's popularity at the beginning of her reign reflected the considerable diversion to Catholicism in England. So you could use uh, maybe a mixture, a couple of those examples to prove that there was support for Catholicism when Mary took over. However, Mary is still going to face problems in restoring Catholicism. Firstly, Protestantism, although a minority, had attracted a following in London and in the South. Secondly, and highly importantly, the Church of England is protected by statute law. And thirdly, linking into that point, the political elite had benefited financially from the acquisition of monastic lands. And if Mary is going to change England to a Catholic country by changing the statute law, she's going to need their support. So I think what you've got to balance here is the fact that whilst there is lots of evidence of popular support for Catholicism, these three issues are significant and they are going to prove very important in the story of Mary's religious policy. This slide, um, please don't feel overwhelmed by it, it outlines the religious change under Mary I, in particular how she changed the church in England from Protestant to Catholic. I'm not going to just read through the different acts of repeal and how religion changed over time. What I think is a more important question to ask here is how easily was Mary able to change the church back to Catholicism? And what's really important here is actually the second act of repeal, because this is the example where Mary really comes into problems in getting what she wants. So the second act of repeal, repealed, um, reversed anti-papal legislation from Henry VIII's reign and it restored papal supremacy so it would make the Pope the head of the Catholic Church again. However, this did not pass easily. So many members of Parliament, MPs, had bought the land that had had monasteries on them before they were dissolved. So Henry VIII uh, under Cromwell um, dissolved the monasteries and then MPs uh, as such would buy that land that's become available. Now Mary essentially wants that land back however the MPs are financially benefiting from this land that they now own so they are very reluctant they don't want to give it back. They therefore try to bargain with Mary. They say to Mary we will vote for your second act of repeal only if we can keep our land, if we can keep the land that we've gained since the dissolution of the monasteries. So that in itself is quite important, the fact that MPs are challenging Mary's authority and trying to dictate their own terms. So that in itself is quite important. Now, the Pope obviously is about to, in, in accordance with this law, become head of the church in England. So he kind of has a say in this. He wants MPs to make him head of the church first, so pass the second act of repeal first, and then after that's happened, he'll consider them letting, um, he'll, consider, he'll consider whether they can keep their land, sorry. Um, however, the Pope did realise that MPs are not going to stand for that. It's like they wasn't born yesterday. They're not going to just say, yeah, we'll just vote you to be head of the church and let you make your mind up later down the line once you've got all the power that you want. Um, so that, as an idea, doesn't really work. So in terms of what does happen, then you've got this bit of a loggerhead really between 
the MPs who want to keep their land, uh, Mary and the Pope who, who want this land back, what we end up with is this decision. The Pope reluctantly gives MPs a papal dispensation. And this is an agreement which allowed them to keep their land. So essentially, Mary and the Pope have given in. They've told the MPs they can keep their land. And in terms of essay questions, you may want to look at how important that is, that MPs have got their own way and the monarch hasn't. Is that a crisis? Um, is it maybe not so far as a crisis, but not great? So you need to decide how bad that is. Secondly, after the papal dispensation, the Pope refuses to give MPs what's called an absolution of conscience. And an absolution of conscience is a promise that they had not sinned when they bought the land. So what's essentially happening here is the Pope is saying you can keep your land, but I'm just telling you the man upstairs isn't happy about this and it, I'm not going to tell you that you didn't sin when you bought it. Which to many people might not seem, especially a modern day audience, uh, might not think that's the worst thing, but again, in a society that's highly religious, that kind of is perhaps more significant than we'd see it. So again, the second act of repeal, I would take some time to get your head around the process. It's quite a lengthy um, situation, but you need to ask yourself, how bad is this for Mary in particular? Um, she's not got her own way. She's had to back down. Um, so you need to decide, does that mean there's a crisis here? or is it not bad enough to be considered a crisis? Beyond the second act of repeal, again, we've got all the different changes. One you'll definitely need to look at is the revival of the Heresy Acts, which sees, uh, according to Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, 289 people burnt at the stake, ranging from vi uh, famous victims such as Thomas Cramner uh, down to sort of ordinary men and women. And again, what you might want to ask here is, are we in a state of crisis? If Mary is having to burn people, does this mean that she is struggling to implement her sort of her vision for religion in England? Especially you can couple it with the fact the second class bullet point, the council, council started to worry and ban young people from seeing burnings. So again, what you need to be thinking about here is, are we in a state of crisis? Is it not bad enough to be considered a crisis? It's kind of that line you're trying to decide between. Something can be bad, but not a crisis. Um, so you just need to decide where your line is. At what point does something become a crisis? Moving on to society then, we've got a, a significant rebellion, I would say, called White's Rebellion uh, that happens in 1554. Now, this slide details the causes and... The reason I've kept this separate actually is the exam uh, can ask you questions on the causation of rebellion. So it would say, what was the main cause of rebellion? And it would likely give you a factor and ask you whether that reason is the main reason why rebellions happened. So I've divided White's Rebellion in terms of the causation into political causes, religious causes and socioeconomic causes. Um, so in terms of political causes, a huge one you need to remember is the concept of exenphobia, which is a fear of foreigners. Um, but what you need to do is then be looking at, is that the main reason when compared against religious causes? So the fact that all the rebels were Protestants and when compared against socioeconomic causes, uh, the fact that the rebellion was a way for lower classes to vent their frustrations. So what you need to do is look at the different causes and decide almost rank order then what is the main cause of this rebellion down to uh, the least cause of rebellion. This slide has the uh, sort of narrative of why it's rebellion and the reason why this is separated onto its own slide is that it is the information you would use if you were asked a question on how far rebellions were a threat, uh, especially to the monarch. So I'm not going to raise, uh, read this line by line. I'm going to pick out key bits you would probably want to consider um, if discussing why it's rebellion as part of an assessment on rebellions being a threat. So four leaders intended to raise rebellions in different areas. However, Wyatt is the only one of the four who is successful in doing this. So what you may question at that point is, 
how much of a threat is this rebellion if only one of the four leaders is able uh, to sort of meet the plan, if you like, and raise the army, the forces they intended to? Secondly, you could look at the second bullet point, the fact that Simon Redord suspects a plot. The Lord Chancellor is uh, made aware of it and consequently the Queen. Um, and what the consequence of this rebellion being um, sort of unfoiled by the government is that the rebellion has to move forward much quicker than intended and it puts pressure on the rebels to act. So again, you could look at that in terms of whether the rebellion is a threat if the government does know it's happening and they are able to put sort of pressure on the rebels um, so that they act in a way that they don't plan to. Most importantly, I would say, is the fact that Wyatt and his rebels reach London. They will not penetrate into the city, they won't get into London, but the fact they get to London, the fact that the only reason that they didn't get into London is the fact that they delayed their march and Mary was able to fortify London. Um, this could suggest that the rebellion was a threat. Um, they are near to where Mary resides. The reason why they don't get into the city seems to be more of a sort of delay on their part rather than the government being highly effective. Um, so you may look at that and question how far this rebellion is a threat if they are able to get to London. However, as with most rebellions, all rebellions we look at, uh, they fail. Uh, this rebellion fails, uh, the aims are not met. Um, so in that obvious sense, um, it's not a threat. However, why it's executed, Lady Jane Grey is executed. Uh, and interestingly, Elizabeth is only arrested. Um, why it doesn't implicate her in the plot directly, so she is spared um, being killed. So it's quite interesting there as well in terms of the consequences of this rebellion. What does that suggest about the level of threat Mary perceives from this rebellion? And last thing we're going to look at is the economy under Mary. Um, you'll notice that the final row says, uh, see Mary part one, that is where finance is covered. So please go back to that video uh, in order to see uh, the financial situation during Mary's reign. Um, as I noted in the first, first part, um, of these two videos on Mary. England faces, English people face considerable hardship under Mary the first in terms of agriculture, 55 to 56 sees heavy rain and consequently the worst harvest of the century. And then the consequence of that is that you get unprecedented rises in the price of grain and widespread, widespread famine. And again, in 1559, what we see is that wages are dropped to 59% of what they had been 50 years earlier due to inflation. Whilst 1559 is when Elizabeth's in charge of England, she's queen. Um, again, it's a consequence of what's happened under Mary. It's not um, an inflation that sort of happened in one year, so to speak. In terms of population, there is a typhus epidemic, which uh, was followed by an influenza sweating sickness epidemic, and that killed uh, one tenth of the people who contracted it. Uh, and it's believed that the population as a consequence may have dropped as much as 5%, which is the worst death toll since the Black Death. So here, what you need to keep in mind is, again, does this meet your criteria of what a crisis is? And I think by many people's standards, it would, especially given that you've got harvest failures and um, disease and epidemics at the same time. And this should hopefully really emphasize what I said in the last video that Mary did pass a poor act, but that shouldn't be used to suggest that there was like no poverty in England because evidently there are significant issues in England when it comes to the economy and kind of by consequence of that society. So again, evidence here, uh, make sure you're confident in using this in assessment, make sure you can articulate in your written work whether you think this is a crisis or not and importantly why. Big thank you to Fran for that. Another really interesting uh, and helpful video on Mary and her reign, looking at those key issues, including uh, religion and the Wyatt Rebellion. So this is part of our series where we're looking at Tudor England, going through Henry VII, Henry VIII, onto Edward, Mary and Elizabeth. It's aimed at helping students doing A-level history, in particular the AQA Unit 1C. 
if you subscribe and turn on notifications then you'll keep getting uh, getting those notifications telling you about when we've added further videos to this series there's also a whole other set of series are on this channel looking at other parts of history also looking at a-level politics so lots of stuff on here that hopefully can help you with your studies and will catch your interest thank you again to Fran for the video and thank you very much for watching